Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Welcome back to Blood Witch History, Ellie. And a little bit of information for you about the naming of people. They tend to be regional. I took historical names, uh, current names, from various different cultures to match. Like the Islanders, you're going to notice some of the names have a Nordic type flair or actual Nordic names. The continent of Ag, the northern part, tends to be more a uh, English, European, Welsh type. And the island of Kelly is more of a made up, but they have a O or a, a heavily influenced sound with short names. And the far south on the continent actually has, and it sounds strange, but historical Native American tones to it. And when you hear those names, you'll think, that's not Native American. Actually, if you do your research, you'll find that some of this stuff is there. It's very difficult to determine, but that's how we do it. Anyway, let's get on with it. This is chapter 12, East. Here we go. The dock worked frantically by the Queen's command to resupply a war sloop that had arrived in port only this morning. As much as possible, a fresh crew was requisitioned, but the captain remained. A weathered mainsail damaged port side railing, and new rigging were the last of the things needed to have the ship ready for departure. The captain had not expected this, nor did any of the Wellsprings military port, but the Queen was in a hurry. No one wanted to disappoint their sovereign, let alone a woman known for her sailing prowess. It is near sunset, but your ship will be ready before the last of the sun falls below the horizon. Captain Guion stood proud of the work his crew and the dock hands had done over the limited time that the Queen had given them. Commendable work, Captain. We replaced a good portion of your crew. Do you know any of these men? Will they be serviceable? Gunnell watched with her seasoned and experienced gaze on all the work that had been done. I know most of them. They are good and trusted. We will sail true and swift. One more thing, Captain. You will need to relieve half a dozen of your soldiers. I will be bringing my own. Pointing off to the lower cliffside balcony, she gestured to three high guard and five royal guardsmen. The honor is multiplied, my liege. I have only served with one high guard my entire career. Guion, considering how oft you've been pilot for royalty, it surprises me. You have proven your skills most often and are trusted with such a crew. And if anything were to fail my standards, I would simply toss you over and take direct command. Gunnell was joking, but gave no hint as to being such. Guion made no sign of being affected by the Queen's command. Of course, my lady. Now, now, Guion. I only jest. The important thing is that you make the ship speed on like lightning. This is urgent. New and larger lateral sails are being installed. The short mass will be under failure stress. However, we can refresh our rigging at Thurid. It has been several years since I have laid eyes on that beautiful port. Guion almost fell out of the moment into fond memories. The port, or the women, the queen mentioned in jest. She knew that both were known as some of the most admirable views. Guion shook his head with a smile. My younger years I would have played to both, but I have been wed for several years now. It's hard to believe, but I no longer look to admire women in such a way. Good for you, Captain. You have a Trodair trade in you. Admirable. A report came from Guion's second in command. The ship was now ready to be boarded by the Queen and her retinue. It is time, my liege. I only wish we had time enough to ready the other two ships that I sail with. We will be vulnerable. Guion then whistled a loud command to the remainder of his crew, instructing them to board. Gunnell turned to her security who had kept vigil from the high station on the cliffside harbor. The eight men gathered their gear and started their walk down the switchback stairs. 
In time, the entire crew were set and making way under oversized sails and lightened hull. The trip from Well Springs to Pole Harbor, called Thurid, would take over a week straight on due to having the trade winds going from east to west. Tacking and fighting waves that could become furious often hindered that expected time. Inexperienced captains were known to find the way too treacherous, choosing to first sail north 200 leagues where the winds were more favorable and most often headed near due east. This added a couple more days to their journey, which time Gunnell did not wish to lose. The first few days had been reasonable and just less than laborious for the experienced naval crew. But on the fifth dusk, a ship was spotted coming from the north at high speed and intent on intercept. Guayan gave command to turn southeast to tack away at best speed. Feeling the sudden turn and acceleration, Gunnell and her guards came topside. The high guard were already on deck, offering their assistance wherever they were called to. Her experience from childhood and a number of sea battles gave her instinctive knowledge that they were about to be attacked. High guard, to me. Bring your crossbows. Gunnell had positioned herself on top of the aft cabin to spy out the makeup of their pursuers. My queen, I have no intention of letting those ships get close enough for crossbows, called out Guayan from his station just forward of his liege. I hope not, but do not underestimate what a high guard can do. They are feared by our enemies for a reason. Many, in fact. Ma'am, the commanding high guard named Calvin reported. I see three ships. They look to be rigged like Northwind faction. Your eyes are better than mine. Look for me. She then handed over an elegantly etched brass and steel scope. Calvin quickly came to the same conclusion. We won't be out running them. The captain needs to be alerted. He then informed him of their plight. Northwind? I haven't seen their like in years. I thought we had exterminated them, called out Guayon. Never underestimate an islander, whether civilized from Polk or independent. These mongrels are more resilient than a Braxton whore. At this comment, both Calvin and Guayan smiled at each other. The queen's fiery personality was coming through her pretended facade of royalty. Her greatest strengths were overcoming and fighting through obstacles of all sorts. Have a fire barrel brought up, also oil. Calvin ordered to the first officer. High guard were always the superior officers in all things except to what comes from the crown only. Captain Guayon, drop the port and starboard sails. Slow the ship for a moment. We want the north wind to gain some ground. Gunnell's order was confusing to the entire crew. The captain was also left in doubt of the command. It made little sense to him. Slower, my queen? You heard the order. Do it. Gunnell's short temper flared. Her order should never be questioned without repercussions. Guayon now sensed disciplinary action would follow soon. How soon, Kelvin? She asked the guard. Another hundred yards, he replied. Placing the oil barrel next to a lip brazier, the second officer stood dumbfounded at the suggestion. That's possible? How? One of the Queen's Royal Guard grabbed the second to get his attention. Quiet. If you have no other duties, watch. This is impressive. In the darkening of the sky, with hues of red and orange on the rise, a bolt from Calvin's double-strung heavy crossbow flew fast and high. It had been soaked in oil and then lit. To the astonishment of those men unfamiliar with these weapons, the bolt missed the target, streaking several yards above the pursuing ship. We have range, Captain Guayon. Hoist the extra sails. Gunnell's command was eagerly received. In just a few seconds, the ship lurched forward with added speed. Men? Calvin motioned to his other two guardsmen. 
They all took aim with the same trajectory as Calvert. The first few volleys missed the enemy vessels. The third set a sail and the deck alight on the lead ship. That is over 400 yards in turbulent waters. Incredible, shouted the second. Ready the ballista, Guayan shouted. That may not be needed. I think I know who these people are. Gunnell turned to Calvin. Bring the signal flags. Are they friends of yours? Guayan waved to his crew, who were bringing the ballista to be mounted aft. Not friends, but we may have an understanding. Calvin returned with a leather case folded open to reveal neatly packed and arranged over a dozen different flags varying in shape, size, and color. Gunnell removed a large red square flag with three diagonal stripes on it. Hoist this next to the royal flag. Quickly, man, she shouted. The second ran and handed the flag to two men at the center mast. In only a moment of time, the red flag flew next to the Trodare crest high above the deck of the ship. We struck them good. The lead ship is having trouble extinguishing their sail. They are falling off. We might not even need to signal them. Calvin and his other guardsmen stood ready to send more bolts at the enemy. Let us see. Raising the scope to her eye, Gunnell watched for signs of pursuing coming to an early conclusion. It did rather quickly. Guayan noticed the sails of the pursuer dropping, choosing to ask even though he knew a reprimand was already coming. You recognize something about them? I did. Their rigging is particularly unusual for Northwind vessels. I am a distant cousin who uses that configuration. The flag we are flying is his clan's friendly sign. I am certain they know who we are now. And with the skill of the High Guard officers, their interest in our ship became null. Now, as for questioning my order earlier, Captain Guion, what punishment do you mete out for your crew when they do the same to you? It was odd for Gunnell to see the captain smile, knowing he was about to be punished. Why the silly face? What did you do? My liege, it was an absurd thing that happened a few years ago. There has remained no interest in any of my crew to test my resolve since then. And out with it. Well, my liege, he was a new recruit. He spoiled a load of potatoes with lye. As punishment, he was sentenced to put his whole head into a well-used chamber pot, then wash his face off the starboard side of the ship while dangling by his ankles. Gunnel grinned. You are an inventive man, Captain Guion, but I'm going to spare you any punishment. You amused me enough to pay for your little lack of decorum. However, I do hope you run afoul of naval code another time. I would very much enjoy seeing this creative form of discipline in action. Of course, my lady. Guion stood straight with gratitude for not receiving the punishment known as the filthy wash. Back on course, Captain, Calvin commanded. Aye, sir. End of chapter 12.